This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 11. Coming up on Space Time... Earth's interior cooling faster than expected. The Milky Way has less mass than expected. And China kicks off 2022 with a classified launch carrying an experimental spy satellite. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study warns that planet Earth is cooling down much faster than previously estimated. The findings reported in the journal Earth and Planetary Science Letters have serious implications for how long life will survive on the planet. Four and a half billion years ago, the Earth was covered in a magma ocean, and slowly over millions, even billions of years, the young Earth cooled, eventually forming a brittle crust on the surface. However, the enormous thermal energy emanating from the Earth's interior has set dynamic processes in motion, such as mantle convection, plate tectonics and volcanism. And this enormous heat also drives the planet's magnetic field, which shields the Earth and life on it from the worst effects of the solar wind and cosmic rays, which would erode away the planet's atmosphere and irradiate the surface. The magnetic field is powered by a geodynamo in which the planet's molten liquid metallic outer core rotates around the solid iron and nickel inner core. Still unanswered, however, are questions of how fast the Earth is cooling and how long the cooling process will continue. One possible answer may lie in the thermal conductivity of the minerals that form the boundary layer between the Earth's core and mantle. This boundary is relevant because it's here that the viscous rock of the Earth's mantle is in direct contact with the hot iron-nickel melt of the planet's outer core. The temperature gradient between these two layers is very steep, so there's potential for a lot of heat to be flowing here. The boundary layer is composed mainly of a mineral called bridgmanite. However, researchers have had a hard time estimating how much heat this mineral conducts from the Earth's core into the mantle. That's because experimental verification is very difficult. Now, scientists from the Carnegie Institute have developed a sophisticated measuring system which enables them to determine the thermal conductivity of bridgmanite in the laboratory under the pressure and temperature conditions that prevail inside the Earth. Now, for the research, they used a recently developed optical absorption measurement system in a diamond unit heated with a pulsed laser. This measurement system allowed them to determine that the thermal conductivity of bridgmanite was something like one and a half times higher than what was previously thought. And this suggests that the heat flow from the core to the mantle will also be higher than previously thought. And greater heat flow in turn increases mantle convection, accelerating the cooling of the Earth. Now all this means that plate tectonics, which is kept going by the convective motions of the mantle, are decelerating faster than researchers were expecting based on previous heat conduction values. The research has also shown that rapid cooling of the mantle will change the stable mineral phases of the core mantle boundary. See, when it cools, bridgmanite turns into the mineral perspirovskite. But as soon as post-perovskite appears at the core mantle boundary and begins to dominate, the cooling of the mantle could accelerate even faster. That's because post-perovskite conducts heat more effectively than bridgmanite. The findings are providing a new perspective on the evolution of the Earth's dynamics. They suggest that the Earth, like the other rocky planets Mercury and Mars, is cooling and becoming inactive much faster than expected. However, the authors still can't tell us how long it will take. Scientists still don't know enough about these kinds of events to pin down their timings. To do that, they'll first need a better understanding of how mantle convection works in spatial and temporal terms. Moreover, scientists will also need to clarify how the decay of radioactive elements in the Earth's interior, one of the main sources of the planet's heat, affects the dynamics of the mantle. A lot still to learn. This is Space Time. Still to come... The Milky Way has less mass than expected, and China starts the new year off with a top-secret rocket launch. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new 
study has determined that our Milky Way galaxy contains far less mass than previously thought. The findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, have determined that the total mass of the Milky Way ranges from between 500 and 800 billion solar masses, indicating a far lighter Milky Way than previous estimates, which had suggested somewhere between 1.2 and 1.9 trillion solar masses. The Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy with an estimated visible diameter of between 100,000 and 200,000 light years. It contains somewhere between 100 billion and 400 billion stars, three quarters of which are red dwarfs. Our solar system is located on the inner edge of the galaxy's Orion arm, 27,000 light years from the galactic centre. The new results are based on the latest observations contained in the third data release of the European Space Agency's Gaia mission, combined with a new generation of dynamical computer modelling. Launched in 2013, the Gaia spacecraft is designed for astrometry, measuring the exact positions, distances and motions of stars with unprecedented precision. The mass of the Milky Way is a fundamental quantity in modern astrophysics and cosmology, which has a direct impact on many astronomical problems. Now, previous studies of galactic dynamics were affected by factors such as the size of the data set. One of the simple truths of science is, too little data means larger uncertainties. But now, astronomers are entering a new golden age of galactic archaeology, with progress on large-scale spectroscopic surveys and high-precision proper motion measurements thanks to the Gaia spacecraft, which is providing full six-dimensional information on key celestial bodies both within and even beyond our galaxy. Using these unprecedented data to study how our Milky Way and its halo were structured and how they were assembled together is one of the central tasks facing astronomers. And dynamic modelling is the central tool used to accomplish this task. To do this, astronomers have used a new generation of analytical dynamical modelling techniques known as action-based distribution function dynamical modelling. They derive the Milky Way baryon mass and dark matter mass distribution function. Baryons are the normal matter which makes up stars, planets, gas and dust in the galaxy. Dark matter is a mysterious invisible substance, most likely made up of yet to be identified, extremely weakly interacting subatomic particles. Scientists know dark matter exists even though they can't see it because of its gravitational influence on the normal baryonic matter. So, by determining the mass of these two components, astronomers were able to develop a more accurate total mass for the galaxy. And thanks to the precise proper motions observed by Gaia, the study's authors were able to derive the most precise kinematic information for around 150 globular clusters in the galaxy's halo. They combined this information with the accurate rotation curve information of the disk region also based on the Gaia data. And knowing this, let them use Kepler's laws to determine mass. This is Space Time. Still to come, China kicks off its 2022 orbital launch campaign with a classified mission carrying an experimental spy satellite, and Virgin conducts its first orbital launch for the year. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China has kicked off its 2022 orbit launch campaign with a classified mission carrying an experimental spy satellite. The Xi'an 13 was launched aboard a Long March 2D rocket from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in northern China's Jiangxi province. The payload was later tracked in a 357 by 1,297 kilometer high orbit inclined by 98.7 degrees. China's state-run media refused to provide any further details about the top-secret mission other than to say it was the first Long March 2D flight to use a 2-metre diameter satellite separation device due to the special requirements of the satellite interface. All China's Cheyenne spacecraft are considered experimental, usually associated with military surveillance and reconnaissance projects. China currently has at least 10 Xi'an satellites in sun-synchronous and geosynchronous orbits. Beijing conducted 55 orbital launches last year and says it's planning more than 40 flights during 2022. This is space time. Still to come, Virgin Orbital kicks off its rocket launch campaign for 2022 and later in the science report, a new study shows that your eye's retina could provide clues about how well you're going to age.
All that and more still to come on Space Time. Virgin Orbit have started the year off on a high note, sending seven small satellites into orbit aboard its Launcher 1 rocket, which was drop launched from the underwing of the company's specially modified Boeing 747 airliner Cosmic Girl. The launch itself occurred over the North Pacific Ocean, about an hour after the mission had taken off from the Mojave Air and Spaceport near Los Angeles. Cosmic Girl is taxing towards the runway. Her engines are all warmed up and ready to go, so we should be wheels up in no time. A 70 foot long Launcher 1 rocket safely nestled under the left wing there of Cosmic Girl, the Boeing 747 carrier aircraft. We're just moments away from one of the early stages of air launch, which is the takeoff of the aircraft from the runway, uh, to begin our transit time of about an hour over to our Pacific Ocean drop point, at which point we will release Launcher 1 to begin powered flight to orbit. And there you have a successful takeoff of Cosmic Girl and Launcher 1 from the runway at the Mojave Air and Spaceport in Mojave, California. Uh, looks like Cosmic Girl is on her way to going above the clouds. And as a reminder, Cosmic Girl will be flying out to the Pacific Ocean to the drop point, which is about 50 miles south of the Channel Islands. So as Cosmic Girl carries our rocket out to the drop point, I wanted to give you a quick rundown of the flight profile you'll see our rocket complete today. To start this segment of our mission, you will hear the pilots yell, release, 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 when we're prepared to drop the rocket. Three seconds after drop, we will ignite our propeller settling thrusters, followed shortly by our main engine start, which will pitch our rocket up and take us through the stage one flight phase. Through the next 150 seconds, our rocket will go from subsonic to hypersonic speeds as we climb up in altitude until we're about 5G in acceleration. At this point, the main engine, or Newton 3, will throttle down until all of the propellant has been expended, and we will transition to main engine cutoff, or MECO. Post MECO, we will go into a short coast until it is safe for stage one to separate away from the rest of the vehicle. Post stage one separation, the rocket's second stage engine, or Newton 4, will begin its first run phase. At this point, we will have reached a huge milestone for our mission and will have made it to space. This will also mark a point where it will be safe to do fairing separation, and set up our system for payload deployment. Around 500 seconds after the start of this portion of flight, we will have reached our transfer orbit and the second engine will cut off and end this first run phase. Next, we will see the vehicle enter in into a maneuver we call the barbecue roll in order to ensure proper thermal balance across the vehicle. From here, we'll fly for about 30 to 45 minutes until we reach the apogee of our transfer orbit. Once we reach the desired point, we will or reorient the second stage for a quick second run phase of the Newton for. This point will be very exciting as we have reached the final desired orbit and we will be ready to deploy the payloads for all of our eager customers. During the flight to orbit, Launcher One will be transmitting a signal containing key mission information for mission control center operators back in Mojave. Telemetry is on a radio frequency or RF signal containing critical information about Launcher One subsystems, performance, and the environments that Launcher One and its payloads will be experiencing during the various phases of flight to orbit. I'll revise LE2 confirmed the rocket is on in two hours. Over base, LE2, aircraft S-Fan and AFS has confirmed to go. Base copies, aircraft S-Fan and AFS has confirmed to go. LRC arm initiated. Second warning. Vehicles in drop ready mode. Copy, drop ready. Pull. Copy, pull. Take no warning. Release, release, release. Looks like we made it above the clouds and onward to orbit. Base copies, we're above the clouds. Ah, oh, it's a beauty up here. Max Alpha flight complete. Station, uh, station one for Max Q Alpha flight complete. We have back to the Long Beach dish for telemetry. Aboard the Launcher One rocket were four U.S. Department of Defense satellites testing new space communications and navigation technology. Also along for the ride were two satellites for the Polish company Sat Revolution, the Stork 3 Earth Resources satellite, and SteamSat 2, which is testing water fueled orbital thrusters. The final satellite in the payload was Adler 1 
which is designed to monitor space debris in low Earth orbit. Let's take a closer look at these payloads. The Pathfinder for Autonomous Navigation, or PAN experiment, demonstrates a low-cost, adaptable, autonomous rendezvous and docking solution using two 3U CubeSats designed with modular subsystem functionality. Technology Education Satellite 13, or TESS-13, is a 3U CubeSat experiment sponsored by the NASA Ames Research Center, exploring novel capabilities including nano-satellite class machine learning, exobraking for rapid deorbit, and advanced communications. The Global Star Evaluation and Risk Reduction Satellite, or GEARS-3, is a 3U CubeSat sponsored by the Air Force Research Laboratory to explore how a prototype patch placed on the exterior can provide details on spacecraft health via commercial satellite network connectivity. And in addition to these four STP-sponsored payloads, Loads. The Above the Clouds manifest also includes three commercial rideshare satellites. Polish new space company Sat Revolution is flying their Stork 3 and Steamsat 2 satellites. Stork 3 joins the Stork 4 and Stork 5 MARTA satellites placed in orbit by Launcher 1 on our 2021 Tubular Bells Part 1 mission as part of Sat Revolution's Earth observation capabilities with a focus on customers in the agricultural sector. SteamSat 2 is a technology demonstration for Steamjet Space System UK's innovative water field thrusters for in-space propulsion. And finally, as a late call-up addition to the Above the Clouds manifest, from final approval to full integration in less than 24 hours is Spire Global's Adler-1 satellite. This 3U CubeSat mission is the first privately organized satellite of Austria tackling the challenge of micro space debris, small particles with high velocities that can pose a serious danger to orbiting satellites. A partnership between the Austrian Space Forum, Findus Venture, and Spire, Adler-1 focuses on detecting nearby objects too small to detect from the ground. This nanosatellite detects space debris via a radar and using a piezoacoustic sensor that vibrates on impact, literally a microphone in space. So as you all might have heard on MCC, we were able to drop successfully and separate from Cosmic Girl. We have already passed a number of milestones on our way here. The rocket is at 3,000 miles per hour. That's around Mach 4, 5, and so we're Definitely cruising through. We already made through our supersonic regime. Shut down commanded. The 10 3 shut down confirmed. Stay up. Brake wire is broken. Fairing, brake wire is broken. We just had successful fairing separation from stage two. Welcome to orbit. Launcher one is, is in space. Virgin plans to undertake six orbital missions this year. That compares to the two it completed in 2021. This is space time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study says immunity after the Pfizer COVID vaccine seems to mostly hold up against the Omicron variant. A report of the journal Nature claims severe disease seemed to be rare among those who'd contracted Omicron after being double vaxxed with Pfizer. This implies some vaccine-induced immunity despite the new variant, so the team looked at how the immune system's T-cells responded to Omicron compared to the original strain of SARS-CoV-2. They found that T-cells reacted in a similar way to Omicron as they did to the original strain, implying that our immune response after mRNA vaccination remains largely intact. Over 5.6 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it first spread out of Wuhan, China. However, the World Health Organization says the true death toll is likely to be at least double that amount, with some 340 million confirmed cases so far. A new study warns that taking in secondhand vaping smoke can increase bronchitis-like symptoms in young people. The findings reported in the journal Thorax found that young people exposed to secondhand nicotine vaping could be at a higher risk of symptoms including regular coughing, congestion and bronchitis. Little is known about the potential risks of secondhand vaping compared to secondhand smoking, so researchers collected survey data from some 2,000 young people with an average age of 17 to compare their secondhand vaping exposure with the rate of bronchitis symptoms, shortness of breath and wheezing. When taking exposure to cigarette smoke and cannabis into account, the researchers say those exposed to vaping were 40% more likely to report bronchitis symptoms and 53% more likely to report shortness of breath. 
A new study has found that images of the retina, that is the nerve tissues at the back of the eye, could predict whether someone's ageing at a faster rate and therefore at a higher risk of earlier death. Scientists created an artificial intelligence program that predicted the age of tens of thousands of participants by looking at images of their retina with an overall accuracy of three and a half years. Following up 11 years later, researchers say that those the artificial intelligence guessed were older than their real age were more likely to have died, excluding deaths from cancer or heart disease. The findings reported in the British Journal of Ophthalmology show that large retinal age gaps were associated with a higher risk of death between 49 and 67 percent. The findings could be used to help identify people who are biologically aging faster and therefore may need more medical attention. If you're one of those people who play lots of games on your smartphone, you'll be interested in gaming PC manufacturer Razer's new cell phone cooling fan, which helps stop those chips from frying. With the details, we're joined by Alex Sahara of Reut from ITY.com. Well, gaming PC and accessories manufacturer Razer has made a colourful USB-C powered fan. So there's no battery, you've got to plug it in, but it clips onto the back of your smartphone and it either uses a universal clamp for, you know, Samsung phones, but for iPhone 12 and 13, it has a MagSafe adapter that <laughs> clips on magnetically. Now, they sell at $60 US each, and this fan has seven blades. Now, it can run at up to 6,400 revs per minute. I think it's noisy, but it's got a minimal fan noise at 30 decibels, and it's obviously designed to keep the smartphone cool because they can start overheating during long gaming sessions if you're outside, it's a hot day, or depending on the phone, if you've got a case on it, which you probably should take off when you're gaming. Um, so because it's a Razer product and they're famous for their RGB range of colors, it can display a rainbow of colors on the back. And look, if you go to Razer.com, R-A-Z-E-R, they also have a gaming finger sleeve that helps you avoid sweaty hands. Uh, they're US 10 bucks. They also have an RGB display, very futuristic looking powered air purifier mask called a Zephyr. And that's a hundred bucks a pop <laughs> for that one. But it looks very futuristic. It was- doing a radio interview. I was outside at the time. It was really hot. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the interview, my phone just went blank. It just died because the temperature had gotten too much for it. Yeah, absolutely. I, look, up in a hot car, your phone can overheat. And a good tip is to get one of those CD player events. If your car still has one of those CD player phone holders, it clips into the CD slot. And normally, they're right in front of or very close to the air conditioning vents. You can also get phone holders that clip onto the air conditioning vents. And so in summer, when it's hot, your phone can be cooled by the air conditioning blasting out of the fan. Yeah, in this case, I was walking through Barangaroo, so unfortunately there was no road and no car for me to be in. So it was just the heat of the day, I'm afraid, but hey, it can happen. How does it actually do the cooling? I mean, It's cooling the outside. It's not cooling ah, the inside right. of the phone. Yeah, yeah. Now... Um, because, you know, they haven't developed a liquid cooling system small enough to be able to fit in that and, you know, transfer the heat to the outside. Even though I have heard of phones in the past that had these cooling vents made of copper, I remember in previous Samsung phones. But um, it's, a, it's a big fan that is cooling the back. It's got uh, this seven blades that are supposed to maximize airflow with this very high res per minute without creating a lot of noise. So clearly uh, it works. I mean, fans do cool things down. We have fans on the top of CPUs inside the computers that on PCs you can hear them really whirring up because they're quite hot compared to the smartphone chips, which have no fans at all. So um, we're both developing ways to cool technology down but also have technology that doesn't require cooling at all, which uh, or at least not fan-based cooling, which is pretty amazing stuff. That's Alex Sahara of Reut from ity.com. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. 
And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 